Soybean School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Syngenta Canada. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to the Soybean School. Today I'm in Waterloo catching up with Jack Legg from SGS Crop Science in Guelph. Sir, how's it going? Going great, Bern. Good to oh, see you again. Awesome. It's great to have you out because I want to talk about something that you do a lot of, and that is tissue testing in soybeans. And when it comes to tissue testing, a lot of growers tend to think about it as a, as a, you know, a reactive uh, tool, you know, looking to identify a deficiency or something like that. But you say, you know, um, there are opportunities to use it proactively. I think so, Bern, yes. Uh, traditionally, soil, uh, soil and tissue analysis quite often happens when there's a problem. Mm. Um, when the crop looks pale or stunted or there's a, a classic deficiency symptom, say a intravenal chlorosis on soybeans, then it's a fairly easy decision to take a sample and send it into the lab. But uh, that same test can be used as a proactive tool uh, to monitor plant nutrition, uh, to make sure that either yield's not getting lost or maybe we can push yield a little bit by feeding the crop. Yeah. So tell, tell me a little bit more about that, Jack. I always thought, you know, that, you know, soybeans are scavengers and they're always scavenging and they're not necessarily looking for nutrients in season um, throughout the year. Um, are, are there opportunities to feed that crop through in, during the year? There is that notion that, that soybeans scavenge. Uh, the research shows that they don't respond that well to additional nutrient. Uh, that said, they do need nutrient. Uh, and in fact, on a per bushel basis, uh, more than corn. So uh, they're removing the nutrient. A, a plant tissue analysis is a good way of monitoring that. Now, as an agronomist, I would always put the, uh, the soil test at the forefront, knowing that you have adequate fertility in the soil to feed the crop uh, is the first step. However, what the soil test can't do is predict how well the crop's going to utilize that nutrient. Uh, and it's not just straight uptake, it could be uh, environmental conditions, compaction, soil moisture, sunshine hours, all these things influence uptake. And with a tissue analysis program, then it might catch some things that we can improve mid-season and, and really push yield. So Jack, to make tissue testing work, you really need to understand, I guess, critical values and, and normal sort of rates of nutrient across your own soybean fields. How do you do that and why is it important? Well, that's right. Uh, the, the test is the first step, but the second step is the interpretation and knowing where you should be. Um, I know in soybeans, we tend not to think about nitrogen too much, but the tissue analysis might reveal a problem with nodulation, for example, or soybean cyst nematodes. Uh, the other plant nutrients, they're usually shown on the report by labs at what a typical range is, a normal uh, range of nutrients or a critical minimum. And those are set compared to uh, field trials. So below critical is where we expect a yield deficiency to occur. Uh, that's based on where 90% of yield is achieved in the crop trial. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the higher yielding crops, you know, we can push those a little bit to make sure they're not on that borderline between low and deficient. Yeah. Talk about, I guess, uh, those, those levels of particular nutrients, um, Jack, and hey, do we have more in, in bigger crops or uh, higher yielding crops? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that there's a, there's a notion that a higher yielding crop is going to have a higher concentration of nutrients in the leaves. That's not necessarily so. For example, uh, two to three percent uh, potassium is what we expect mm -hmm. to see. So a high yielding crop doesn't suddenly have five or six percent. It has the same concentration, but it's taking more nutrients out of the soil into the plant. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to see uh, phosphorus is a little less than you might expect. It's at about 0.4 uh, percent. And the micronutrients are measured in parts per million. Mm -hmm. One in soybeans that we pay attention to is manganese, uh, around 14. And you know most of the micronutrients are around 20 parts per million, but it ranges from four in copper to about 30 in iron. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about those, uh, those yield contest winners we hear so much about. And, uh, Alex Harrell last year set the record in Georgia, 206 bushels. Now, he says he tissue tests every week. Now, that, uh, I would, you would suggest, uh, is a proactive approach using tissue tests. But I guess it's probably not realistic for a lot of growers. Uh, you know, what does, um, I guess, a, a good protocol for, uh, for the, an average grower who's trying to optimize yield look like? Yeah, that, I would say that uh, most of those yield challenge winners are using tissue analysis as part of their routine, part of their 
nutrient management. Uh, they also have some other benefits and in infrastructure that the average uh, soybean farmer doesn't have, like irrigation, yeah. for example. So they do test intensively, but they also can react to that with a higher frequency. They can fertigate. Uh, uh, they're irrigating their crops. They can do things on the fly that uh, some of us can't. But that said, to introduce a tissue program, uh, once in the juvenile stage, you know, we're looking at this field here, it's come up quite nicely. Later on mid-season, we can come in, say, around flowering and take some trifoliate samples to, to see where the crop's at and make sure that there's nothing lacking and push some nutrition a little harder for a fast-growing crop. Now, you mentioned uh, as well, I mean, like that, that two-testing approach may be a, a good starter for a grower who's trying tissue testing for the first time, but you can ramp it up. Yeah, that would be a good start. Uh, I think the, the rule of thumb would be test as frequently as you're willing to manage. Yeah. So if you're able to come in and, uh, and react and do some either foliar or mid-season nutrient applications, then by all means, you could ramp up the frequency of the testing. Yeah. Hey, final question for you, and that is about, you know, gathering samples, you know, yes. how much and where, where, where should we be collecting them across the field? That's a great question because we need enough material to work with, uh, and we also want a good representation of the crop. So a single plant's not enough. We, we sometimes get that at the lab where a single plant will come in the door. Um, on, a, on a stage like this where they're, they're just coming out of the ground, it's a juvenile plant, we wanted to see the whole plant uh, minus the roots, so the whole top growth. And about 35 to 50 plants should do it, but the more the better. Uh, we need, in terms of mass, 200 grams of material. That's about a quarter pound. So if you picture a paper lunch bag about a third full, that's enough material to work with. And, and, and sometimes separating out the samples uh, to capture that variability is a good idea. So in this case, behind us, we've got some upper slope positions, we've got some lower slope, and the two might offer different uh, nutritional profiles of the plants in season. So uh, if you're willing to manage those different areas, then there's another spot we can maybe push some yield. Yeah. Hey, uh, great insights, Jack. I always appreciate you making some time for the Soybean School. Glad to do it, Bern.